Hello, all you skebes. This is Great Answer with the Kink Sex Culture Podcast, and uh, I'm coming to you live from the Philly Grew in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and it's at the Philly Music Hall, which is a absolutely gorgeous space, and if you ever want to do anything kink-related, you should come to the Philly Music Hall. Uh, look them up online. It is uh, different than any other kink space you will be to in the U.S. Uh, it is just... It is an old music hall, and um, I'm sitting up here on the balcony. People are busy eating food that magically appeared here at the Gru. Um, anyone who wants to be on the podcast, are you having fun at the Gru? Yeah. All right, cool. That uh, totally wasn't pre-recorded. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, this podcast, like my other podcast, is brought to you by two wonderful, wonderful sponsors. Uh, the first one is Twisted Monk, who creates fantastic bondage rope. You can find his stuff at twistedmonk.com. And every month he has a different color of the month. I don't actually don't know what July's color of the month is yet. Um, but uh, it's it, they usually sell it very quickly, so it's worthwhile getting his newsletter and uh, finding out. You can also, if you use the link on kinksexculture.com, uh, to Twisted Monk, then you will also be helping to support the podcast, which we always appreciate. Um, and uh, just dropping him a line and saying, hey, we like uh, your stuff. We also are deciding that his candles are the official candles of Ropecraft. So if you want to do wax play at Ropecraft, you should get some of his candles. And if we get lucky, maybe we'll be able to get some Ropecraft-themed Twisted Monk candles. But we'll see about that. No guarantees. Um, also, Lee Allure. Uh, Lee Allure is a hypnotist, both professional and erotic, uh, and you can go to leeallure.com to get some really cool things. Uh, among other things, I know she was recently working on one that is specific to chastity play, uh, which is a interesting hypnosis kind of thing. Um, can you imagine being into chastity play and being told, sure, you can try and come all you want, but I put in a hypnotic trigger so you can't come even though you're trying really hard. Um, that would, among other things, fuck with your brain. I can see my servant Naya is nodding her head like, you yeah, know, that would be... That would suck. Yeah, that would suck. So, um, but I personally, as, as I've said before in this podcast, I used her work to uh, help me with my memory. Uh, she helped me do some hypnosis to improve my memory for names and faces. And... Um, you know, unfortunately, I also lost my memory for places and amounts. But other than that, it's no, I'm just kidding. It was fine. Um, but thanks, Lee, for doing a so, for supporting this podcast. And if you go to leeallure.com, you can find out more, including free downloads for hypnosis stuff. Speaking of mind fuckery, <laughs> I'm very happy to have here um, a friend of mine, uh, a fantastic performer. Who, by the way, at some point I'll tell you how you scared me to death at Ropecraft. Um, uh, fantastic performer and also the head of our medical team at Ropecraft, um, Oranis. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, do you want to... That was all the intro that I could give. Do you have any other intro you want to add to that? Like, <laughs> who are you and how did you come to be here? <sighs> okay, um, so... I, I'm called Oranis on FET, but I don't mind if people call me O, because I know it's hard to pronounce. Um, I've been in the scene for, God, about five years. Um, I didn't or originally come to the scene as a rope person, but my, my love of rope really quickly developed. Um, in, my, in my free time, I work a real job, um, and I'm, I'm, well, I'm studying to be a medical professional. Um, I am, um, I'm just going to out myself. I'm in, I'm in an eight year program to pursue an MD PhD. So I'm not, I'm not licensed yet, but, um, I will be in four more years. And, um, so neurochemicals and neurology and how it's affected by what it is we do is a, is a point of geeky love and interest for me. Cool. Me too. Um, I was uh, asked by Lee to do a class a while back called Woo Woo What the Fuck, which is about, um, it's scene energy for skeptics. So it's more specifically like when you have a con crush, what are the chemicals that are going through your brain? Um, what is the effect of a scene maybe have to feed into the cognitive biases that people tend to have anyway? Um, and so that's kind of where my, my focus was. But 
uh, I think it, it's it, it's interesting to compare notes and and see where things come from. So um, I'll, I'll let you start. <laughs> what what happened? What when you talk about uh, your your brain on kink? Are you talking about like specific um, specific types of scene or specific types of play? Um, so I I recently taught a course um, on, about neuro, the neurochemistry and neurology of BDSM. Um, and in that, I looked specifically at um, sadomasochistic play. Okay. Um, most, mostly at sadomasochistic play. And I looked at it both from a neuroanatomical perspective, looking at the nerve endings in your body, both in the peripheral nervous system, mm-hmm. so all the nerves in your skin and in your muscles and in your viscera, and also the nerves in your central nervous system and how those pathways might be affected by sadomasochistic play. Okay. And then I looked at um, four, I picked out four neurochemicals um, that would be specifically affected by sadomasochistic play. Cool. Let's let's start there because I'm interested. I, I, I tended to pick out a few neurochemicals as well. Okay. Let's see if our collections match. Okay. What, what four do you talk about? The four that I had spoken about were endorphins, um, which are actually, I'm, I'm grouping endorphins all as one neurochemical, but they're not. It's actually 40 different proteins, and what they have in common is that they are endogenous morphines. So they, they bind to opioid receptors, the same receptors that morphines that we give to people bind to. Um, So that's the one. The other is adrenaline um, or epinephrine as it exists in the peripheral nervous system. That's uh, norepinephrine and noradrenaline as it exists in the central nervous system. Uh, That's the fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Um, The fight or flight. Yep, (laughs) fight or fuck or freeze. Or or posture. They keep adding adding little acronyms. (laughs) Um, and then I looked at oxytocin. Um, that's our trust hormone, our connect and happy uh, hormone. That and inspires jealousy. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a little bit on that too. And then I looked at dopamine. <laughs> well, we're four for four. This Are is we? great. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the only thing I added in besides that is I also talk about um, testosterone and estrogen. Nice. Um, as being, those are the driving uh, uh, hormones that drive us to say, I want to get some. They drive us out to define stuff. And then oxytocin is the opposite, which says, okay, I got some. I'm going to stay here. You know, that kind of thing. Um, a quick question for you. One of the things that I, I always have to update my class because I, you know, looking into things. And one of the interesting research things was to find out when people say, oh, my brain is full of endorphins, that endorphins actually can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's actually, they think it's endocannabinoids. It's basically the equivalent of canna- cannabis in your brain. So that was an interesting... I mean, it, it, it means the same thing functionally for my class. I just always... I didn't want to have somebody say, well, you know, actually, it's not endorphins. Um, but that kind of thing. So from the reading that I did recently from my class, I looked at some of the primary sources. And one of the sources that I looked at actually pointed to areas in the brain that endogenous morphines are created. Oh, cool. Um, and so... So they have their own little plants inside the brain. Okay. Yeah. And the interesting thing to me was that different areas in the brain from which they're created have different have different psychological effects to oh, where they oh. combine. Unpack that. Um, so, for example, um, they can be they can be created um, released from an area called the um, the uh, nucleus raphae magnus. Um, that's that's kind of the one big one, and I'm finding finding it here. Um, so, the endorphins created from the nucleus or released from the nucleus raphia magnus are those that produce analgesia. Are so painkillers. Painkillers, okay. exactly. Um, so they are actually created within the brain, um, and they they are binding specifically actually to. Um, mu, delta, and kappa opioid receptors. It doesn't matter what kind of opioid receptor those endorphins bind to, it will always cause analgesia. However, there are, there are, there are endorphins that are released from other areas of the brain that have different effects. So, for example, um, there's some that produce euphoric states, like comparable to narcotics. 
um, and like generous, generally positive emotions. And I don't have that, that space on me right now in my notes. Mm -hmm. Um, but they bind specifically to other receptors. They're binding more specifically to the mu, mu and delta only receptors. And that, that can make you happy. However, endorphins that are released from that same space in the midbrain, if they bind to kappa receptors, they can actually produce a dysphoric state. Um, okay. Areas of increased anxiety. So, how do and I'm going to sort of jump from the micro to the the macro here, um, especially since you went into the anxiety part of things. One of the the parts I find interesting with the whole reflex action of things is that when you like when I go up to Naya and I punch her, this is the the real sound of me punching Naya in the arm. Ow! So, when I punched her in the arm. The, the impact went to her amygdala first, and she had a response, and then her brain made sense of the response, mm -hmm. which in this case was, oh, my Dominus is using me as a demonstration tool for my thing. I'm, I'm so happy I'm being in service. I've had three orgasms. Um, <laughs> yes, that is exactly what happened. Right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, that, you know, the brain makes sense of it afterwards. Yeah. Um, is this kind of, when you say when it bonds to the kappa receptors, mm -hmm. it can cause dysphoria, mm -hmm. is it still possible that we could eroticize the dysphoria? I mean, is that, because when we have people that say they like to be scared or they like to be mind fucked, yeah. is this part of the, the idea? Um, I don't, I don't have primary literature on me right now that, that speaks to that. It's okay. This is a podcast. We don't need references. Okay. <laughs> Um, I would imagine so because after we're after we're binding to kappa receptors in the midbrain, then the brain does what it does with any sensory input, which sends it through the thalamus, which is mm -hmm. kind of the great, the great um, way station of the brain, and then up to areas of the forebrain um, where it can be processed. We can do higher order thinking, and much like Pavlov's dog, if we're pairing scary sensory input with positive interactions such as, you know, Naya's relentless orgasms, <laughs> we're going to have positive effects. Of now you need to add that to the Gronomicon. <laughs> Naya's relentless orgasms, yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'd imagine okay, so. Okay, cool. All right. So, sorry to, to derail a little bit there. Um, so uh, that, that's the um, endorphins, okay? Okay. Um, and in terms of endorphins kind of come later. The, the adrenaline and the noradrenaline is what comes first when you're given stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that fascinated me was that whole process of triggering. And, um, what, uh, what kind of things do you see adrenaline and how that affects our kink? Um, so like we already mentioned, um, adrenaline and noradrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine as it's, as it's called in the medical community, um, is that fight or flight hormone and it can be released um, from in the body it's released in your adrenal glands so mm -hmm. ad meaning above renal meaning kidneys they're sitting on either side of your kidneys like a little like a little hat right Wait, above so it. if we flog the kidneys harder right then we'll be, be stimulating more adrenaline no 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 That's no no <laughs> Evan's giving me a thumbs up. It must be true. No, th that is totally not true. That is, please do not quote Aranus as saying that. You can quote Evan as saying that because it's wrong. Um, <laughs> and um, in, but it's also released in in the central nervous system as well. M it, much like um, endorphins, it's released in the midbrain. Um, but it, it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, as, as you okay. already mentioned. So if you have more adrenaline released from the body from, you know, repeatedly flogging the adrenal glands, <laughs> um, it's not going to create a, a more profound effect in, in your mood, in your central nervous system, because the, the adrenaline, the noradrenaline that affects your mood is being created and processed within the brain itself. And actually you can see if you look at the molecules, they're even, they're slightly different. Huh. Um, the, the molecule as, as it exists in the brain has a carbon and three and two hydrogen less than the molecule as it exists in the body. 
So how separated are these systems then? It seems like there's two adrenaline systems there. So like this is how I'm picturing somebody who is not experiencing any physical stimulus, but their brain is just going a million miles an hour mm -hmm. um, versus someone who is having the shit beat out of them in some thing, but their brain is like going, well, I need to get milk on the way home. I need to get eggs and, you know, things like that. I mean, is that how, is that how separated things can be? And, or do these work hand in hand or? So from what I've read, they work mostly hand in hand. Um, of interest though, there is a, a surgical procedure called a sympathectomy. Sympathectomy. Mm -hmm. Evan, you've had one of those, haven't you? Yeah, you don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you can you can actually cut um, people get them in their hands they they have their sympathetic nerves cut to their hands that innervate their hands so their hands don't sweat as much so if they're in a professional setting they can shake hands and not look nervous because what adrenaline does uh -huh. is it it causes all of the systems to turn on so you're having increased perspiration your pupils are dilating your heart's going faster your bronchioles, your lungs are opening, you're getting ready to run from a bear. Right. Um, and centrally, in, inside your brain, everything, like you said, is going faster, 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 faster. So they, that is my only knowledge of them being disconnected. Otherwise, in response to a fear or pain input, it's all going to turn on at once. Okay. So, um, and it can be a lot of fun to do that, you know, to have that kind of experience, which is why we get on roller coasters why we have scenes with scary people and things like that. Um, is there a, uh, do these things downregulate or upregulate in terms of, will I get less excited by, well, for, actually, so here's, a, I, I, this is kind of the question. I was sitting at camp the other, last weekend, and there was a plethora of bare chests around me. And I thought, I said to a friend, you know, there was a time when my, my singular goal in life was to, you know, catch a slight glimpse of cleavage or something like that. And now, you know, it's like, it's, and, and at the same time, well, I don't have the little ba bump ba bump ba bump oh my God, um, at that moment in camp, if someone is wearing a dress with cleavage, I do get that, even though I may be very familiar with their breasts. And I'm wondering if, like, there's always going to be that. I mean, obviously, another way to measure it, but I'm wondering if there's a different reaction or if it's the same reaction or how that works I'm no clue sure. I'm really not sure you can measure it with a penile plus plethysmograph penile plethysmograph plethysmograph okay what what is the it's a blood flow blood flow to the penis yeah. okay gotcha we should test that I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not sure. I would imagine okay. that that is a, um, just like we were talking about normalization of sensory input before. Yeah. I guess I'm wondering, I guess I'm what I'm, I guess the other way to put this would be to say, does hedonic adaptation have to do with that? Because, you know, where, where things that are fun at first aren't, don't get as fun, um, which is the problem with like addiction. You know, you need to have more and more and more to stimulate you. But at the same time, you know, if, if Naya's wearing a low-cut blouse, I will be just as happy as I was as a kid. Yeah. Um, it's just now I have the right to reach in and grab her boobs. That sounds like more of a dopaminergic pathway. Oh, good. Good segue. Let's talk about dopamin dopaminergic pathways. Um, I'm assuming they have to do with dopamine. Yeah. And yeah. Naya's boobs. Like, look, you can see the outline of them. Yeah. And now Naya shows her boobs. Just as exciting. Yeah. So. Very, very exciting. Well, yeah, that sounds the like... Facilitator announcement up here. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds like um, it would be secondary to dopamine, and that is that is the um, neurochemical that we think about when we think about addiction. Yeah. Um, I, I heard that it's, it's kind of a misnomer to say, it's the same as cocaine, because it's not really the same as cocaine. No. It's because your body doesn't make cocaine. Yeah, but, but it does have to do with how we process cocaine. Okay. Um, so what happens when, when we take cocaine is that the dopamine reuptake receptors, so there's these little, like, little, like, mouths sit on the outside of cells, and um, they take the dopamine out of the neural synapse. They just kind of, like, numb them, and they take them in. <laughs> so you stop having dopamine bounce around in your neural synapse, um, and so you cannot experience such a massive pleasure stimuli um, but what cocaine does is it just kind of like sits in the mouth 
um, th- that receptor and doesn't let it numb on dopamine. Um, and so the <laughs> dopamine just like keeps bouncing around just forever and ever and ever until finally the body is able to process that cocaine and get it out of the system. Okay. Um, and our and our brains respond incredibly strongly to to dopamine. It's it's been singled out as um, necessary to almost all addictive pass- pathways hmm. because it's part of a pathway that starts in the su- in the substantia nigra, goes through the nucleus accumbens. It's literally called the reward pathway. It is how we as humans process rewards. So if you're looking at Naya's breasts and they cause pleasure to you, every time that you see them and they cause pleasure to you, you are strengthening that reward pathway and a bit of dopamine is being released. Uh, now, so does this include, because I have the power of imagination, when I am, say, imagining Naya's breasts or seeing a picture of Naya's breasts or yeah. drawing Naya's breasts? I mean, that's still all part of the reinforcing it? And every time every time you interact mentally with Naya's breasts ah. and it causes a reward for you, you are strengthening that neural pathway. I live a very rewarding life. <laughs> good to know. My therapist would be very proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> <through their own pathways. laughs> that's true. <laughs> um... Okay, so but uh, but dopamine has a, I mean it's it's one of those things that, like you have a flash of it and then it fades, mm-hmm. and I spend a lot of time talking about the effects of uh, prolactin and vasopressin as they come in after dopamine. Do you want to talk about that or you know, please yeah. please talk about it. So it's my understanding that uh, I actually could pull up my notes here so I don't mess up, but basically the mm-hmm. the prolactin and the and the vasopressin are um, what's well, the idea that you you can't be you can't be high all the time. Um, so there it is. Actually, prolactin and cortisol. So um, prolactin is a stress hormone that has associations with feelings of depression and alienation, which um, there was just recently somebody, I think it was Dr. Arabelle, actually, who was talking about um, after masturbation, there's this feeling of loneliness and depression that can come across. And that's exactly what I was, what I was thinking of, is that the prolactin comes in, and the cortisol levels are, um, increases, which is also associated with depression. And this is also, these, the release of these things is what makes the whole stereotype, sometimes stereotype, sometimes not, of rolling over and snoring after you have an orgasm. Yeah. It's the like, French, yay, that was great. The hmm. French call it le petit mort. Yes, the a little death. Feeling yes. of complete emptiness. Right. Um, and uh, that you can counter this with a new stimulus but it will require a bigger stimulus than was originally done the first time. So there's a sort of a diminishing returns unless you always find something to hit them harder with or fuck them deeper with or whatever, bite them harder with, whatever your, whatever your, uh, your trips your trigger, so to speak. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the prolactin, the course, all... And the other thing that it was related to that was the vasopressin, um, which reduces level of testosterone, and it is also like oxytocin, a very pair bonding thing. And basically, if you are masturbating, and this may be part of why masturbation can give you that feeling of aloneness, whereas doing something in a pair or more of people, because at the end, if you have someone to cuddle with, you have oxytocin coming around. And if you don't have someone to cuddle with, then there's nothing to stimulate the oxytocin. And therefore, you're just sitting there wallowing in the prolactin. This is all from someone who, by the way, has a dance degree, so really doesn't know what he's talking about. Sounds good to me. <laughs> you say sound? But it sounds good to her, so then we're good. <laughs> Um, so should we talk about uh, you have more about dopamine or do you want to skip to oxytocin? I, I love oxytocin. I think that's really exciting. We forgot to talk about um, something with adrenaline that I'd love to hear. Oh, okay, so sure. With you. Back to adrenaline. Um, I know in the scene we talk a lot about blood sugar surges and our blood sugar drops post scene. Let's talk louder for Oh, um, I know a lot in the scene we talk about blood sugar surges or blood sugar drops post scene and that's secondary to that's secondary to adrenaline. Oh, okay. Um, and so what happens is when when we get that fight or flight response, um, your body decides that it's time to release massive amounts of blood sugar. 
Um, and not only does it release massive amounts of blood sugar, but it, it wants you to create even more because it doesn't know how long you're going to be running from a bear or being flogged for or being in the most intense rope scene of your life. It wants you to be able to do that for it. And, and I, I have charts here that you can't see on your, um, on your podcast, but, um, we can always connect them in the show notes yeah. on kingsexculture.com. I'll send them to you. Um, but we've studied it 90 to 120 minutes out and your body is still, you're still releasing sugar at that point and creating sugar at that point. So you end up in a hyperglycemic, um, physiologic state for an extended period of time. But two plus three plus hours out is when not only have you processed all of that blood glucose, but you've depleted your stores as well. And that is why, um, you can have trouble with temperature regulation. You can have trouble with, um, as Lizard says, decreased frustration tolerance. Mm -hmm. Um, cognition. Yeah. It can also be difficult. Or, um, I find that my hands get shaky. Yeah, that's that's all secondary to that, and that's why like I, some people like can poo poo aftercare. Like I don't need aftercare. Um, you know, I'm kind of like above that, beyond that. This isn't a big deal. But there is actually a physiologic basis for why we in the scene have historically done aftercare, mm-hmm. and it's 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 secondary to that. And so, I guess uh, let's talk about what good aftercare is for that. I mean, that means whiskey and cigar, right? <laughs> restore things. Yeah. Or just another blowjob. <laughs> you know, I am such a, um, like, a moral and ethical and just humanist relativist. And I think that anything that, anything looks very, very individual. But I I, mean, I guess I'm thinking in terms of, um, are there specific things that will help restore the, the blood sugar? I mean, are we talking Snickers bar or are we sure. talking... Yeah, sure. Okay. Why not? Snickers bars are great. Um, more complex carbs are better. Okay. Um, but if you're if you're low, then a an orange juice would be great because that simple sugar will immediately replace you. But then you're not done because you're still you still have repleted your stores. So a slice of wheat bread, um, something with something like a rice, something with a more complex starch carb okay. that will will help you rebuild your stores. Also donuts. You, uh, donuts are more of a simple carb, especially with glaze. But you know, if you get a whole wheat donut, you can get there. I, you, you're Costello, I'm Abbott. Okay, it's, or no, the other way around. I can't remember which one's which. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm deli- basically as you're listening to this podcast, anything I say, probably you should pretend is a joke, and anything Oranis says, you should take seriously. Um, what about bacon? Your body can use proteins to create glucose stores. So, and bacon has a lot of lipids, and your body can do something called gluconeogenesis, which is the creation of glucose stores, I'm sorry, the creation of glucose and glucose stores from lipids, which are fats. Um, so, you know, bacon could eventually do it. Your body would probably use that bacon to create something called ketone bodies. If your brain is very low on glucose, it runs on ketone bodies that are directly created from fats and proteins. Um, that would more likely be where that was kind of streamlined too quickly. Hmm. Cool. Is this why I want pasta after a convention? Absolutely. The, the question was, is this, is this why Naya wants pasta after a convention? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why pasta before a convention, that's that's going to build your glucose stores for sure. Spaghetti breakfast. <laughs> we used to have that for swimming. I mean, yeah. swimming, we'd have spaghetti breakfast. Yeah. So that makes sense. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we were going to go on to talking about oxytocin, which I'll be honest. Okay, so I, I, I used to love oxytocin a lot, and then I started reading about it, and I realized that the, that pair bonding and that belonging and things like that also translates into possessiveness and jealousy. And so while it is the love hormone, it is also kind of the anti-compersion hormone. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and that, I think, is something that we need to be a little more aware of in, in our communities. Um. I would love to hear more about those studies. The studies that I looked specifically into um, were were more about its release um, post orgasm and peer bonding. Um, I did, however, look at um, uh, its effect on anxiety and in group. So, in group anxiety, um, which okay. is I think starts to touch onto um, what you're talking about. Um, so, the studies I found found that. Um, 
people with increased uh, increased amounts of oxytocin had greater um, greater responses to someone in their in group being attacked whatever in group that that might be there were a couple different variables but these were mostly race studies they're very old okay um um, but there, there have subsequently been created in in groups um, where, like, people have done a bonding experience, and then someone there was a perceived slight against someone, and people with more oxytocin have responded more um, aggressively to perceived slights. I can't believe you would treat the top that way. That's just terrible, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I haven't really seen a lot of the um, primary literature, and I'd love to hear about it. I, I would ha- I'm looking at my references and I don't see a direct reference to it, so I'll have to look that up again and figure out which one it was. Um, so the other thing I like about oxytocin, um, aside from the fact that it counteracts the prolactin and the depression and things like that, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy, is uh, that it is equally done between you know, whether you are giving or receiving the care and that it can be... Yeah. <laughs> and that it can be... Um, uh, done even just thinking about taking like if i'm talking with naya and talking in a caring way over the phone or over video we're still building that kind of that oxytocin kind of thing um not just it doesn't have to be just touchy-feely kind of stuff yeah um i just pointed to an area of my notes which was a 2003 study where they studied dogs and humans and the humans pet the dogs for a half hour and they measured oxytocin levels in both the dogs and the humans and they were both increased at five minutes and maxed out at 24 minutes wow so half hour of cuddling is what you need absolutely yeah um actually speaking just to go back to speaking of causing reactions um another study that that i found was uh studying the the uh production of adrenaline and norepinephrine and and that, that stuff uh, in dominant and submissive animals, and it was that um, submissive animals, the, the mere presence of a dominant animal, a predator or something like that, will cause the, the submissive animal to have this jump jolt in the, uh, the adrenaline. Um, the, the predator doesn't have to do anything, like just being there is what does it. And the interesting thing was that the reverse does not take effect. So... Obviously, anyone who is in a dominant position is actually oppressed because they don't get the, you know, <laughs> adrenaline rush from that. And it, no, okay, not really. But so what you're saying is that I'm in a con- constant state of heightened adrenaline. Yes, of course. That's the whole. That's where the orgasms come from. <laughs> the, rel- the relentless orgasm. Um, that's why my heart no, went a flutter when you came in the room. I, you know, th- this actually has something to do with uh, open space. Just to, just to tangentialize it, the whole thing. That's a new word. We watched Will Shakespeare. I can invent words. So, um, the, uh, in open space, the traditional open space, I don't usually talk about these, but there's two types of people, butterflies and bumblebees. And the bumblebees are the people who sort of cross-pollinate the, con- the discussions. Like they use the law of two feet and they say, hey, oh, hey, over there they're talking about this thing which really relates to here in this, in this kind of thing. And they buzz around from place to place to place. And the butterflies are the people who don't actually say much. But when they come into a group, everybody just kind of goes, <gasps> And takes a breath or just feels enervated or whatever. And like this is a, a, a known effect in these kinds of things. And, and it, is, it is useful to kind of identify them and let people, you know, be that kind of situation. Um, or sort of realize that, they, that that can be disruptive at times. <laughs> but it's that same kind of idea of, uh, you know, butterfly or dominant or whatever you want to call it. But it's that person who when they walk into a room, everybody just kind of has this... Oh, that person's here, you know. Um, and and I've known many people like that who I won't embarrass by naming on the podcast. Um, but but uh, yeah, that that's an interesting effect. Um, so what else about uh, you, you? You talked about all of these these hormones going into a sadomasochistic context. So how do they how do they work together in? Um, I mean, when you say sadomasochistic, you're talking about like the activity of causing pain to somebody else. Well, 
well, or receiving pain. Yeah, that is how I started kind of designing this class because I was I was asked to teach this class for um, the Bondage Education Network and which, which is a brand new uh, I'm saying Bottoming Education Network, which is a brand new. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It's a brand new group out of Baltimore, um, and so. I didn't know kind of where to start looking, so I, I went from my, my own where I started in kink, which was sadomasochism, um, and I started looking at, you know, what what a bottom might experience um, neurochemically and actually neuroanatomically after painful sensory input. Okay. And so I, I started at the periphery and I started looking at, you know, different types of sensory pathways and at exteroceptors, and those are the receptors that are on the outside of the body that exist on the skin. And I, I started looking at different um, types of core puscles, which are which are the, the nerves that exist within the skin. I looked at Meisner's core puscles that look at that deal with fine touch and Piscinian corpuscles that are deep touch mm-hmm. um, and firing and how they might get used to that. And then I looked at where they would synapse and come into the central nervous system. They, they are connected to different dermatomes, so different parts of the skin. Um, they're going to receive that painful, let's, let's call it a smack. So the Meisner's corpuscles are going to receive the smack and they're going to say, oh, there's something painful happening here. And that sensory input is going to go into the central nervous system in the spine. It's going to synapse on an area of the spine that will allow the body to localize it. And then the next nerve is going to take that up to, up to the thalamus, um, where where it's going to be integrated and it's going to have another neural synapse um, and then from the thalamus it's going to go to the area of the brain that processes sensory input and those are on the opposite side of the brain from the body mm-hmm. and right if you go right by your ear and then up towards the crown of your head that that is where there's literally a map of the body, of the sensory part of the body that that processes each area that the sensory input occurred, and so your body, your brain's going to go, oh, okay, now we had sensory input. How how do I feel about now, that? Is this one of those like those images where like you see people on an operating table with their head open and they're poking little things into the brain and they say, what do you feel now? You're like, oh, I feel burning in my left foot. And mm-hmm. That's how. We, okay. Yeah, um, we. I mean, Sounds like a hot scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> La- the ultimate lazy top, you know. I'm not going to actually do the things. I'm just going to stimulate your brain in those areas. <sighs> That's terrifying. <laughs> and kind of arousing. It's scarousing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but then we're going to figure out how we feel about that. So the, the midbrain, the hypothalamus, um, the nucleus accumbens, the nucleus raphae magnus, which are all back in the midbrain are going to go, oh, we have all this like painful sensory input. How do I feel about that? Well, <laughs> I feel scared, so I'm going to turn on the adrenergic system, so I'm going to start pumping out some norepinephrine. I am in the middle of vigorous exercise, and I'm receiving receiving painful sensory input, so I'm going to produce some analgesia, um, which is which is those endorphins, and they are also, by the way, going to make me feel pretty high, mm-hmm. um, because your body doesn't want you to go out upset. It wants you to it wants you to go out pretty happy and maybe a bit dissociated, um, which the epi- the endorphins do both of those things. It's been fun, but here. And um, afterwards, if you if you kind of you live through the ordeal like scene. Um, or even during it, if you're enjoying it, you're going to have some dopamine. Um, Just to be clear on this, when you say your brain's going to decide on what to do with it, it's not a. We're still talking about autonomic situations. We're not talking about we're consciously able to control it, right? No, not. I, at I, all. I wanted to clarify that because, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. Unless you have created that level of mindfulness. I'm, I'm just waiting for somebody to be like, well, I'm going to release some dopamine now. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, you're gonna have you're gonna have oxytocin and, and ways that you bond with the partner. Right. So that's my cool. Um, did you find any uh, specific differences in types of 
Um, like I, I looked a little bit into like fast twitch muscles versus slow twitch muscles and um, moderate like a long rope scene versus mm -hmm. a single tail scene and um, the different kinds of effects that, that might cause that. Um, one thing that I found was that the dopamine, or not dopamine, sorry, the, uh, the oxytocin would obviously build more from like a long, moderate level rope scene um, as opposed to from a fast, you know, quick suspension or something like that. Um, I didn't look specifically into that. I think I, I think I didn't see the forest for the trees when okay. I started my my research, and I was looking. The only thing that I looked at that could be related is that different types of pain receptors on the uh, on the exterior and interior of the body um, acclimate at different speeds. Oh. So we have we have um, some receptors that um, they are what's called tonic um, and so they have a rapid fire when the stimulus starts and then there's a constant slow fire of the receptor and they tell you that the stimulus is still there so for example if you have a fudo on you and you are hanging from this fudo your tonic receptors are gonna go ow 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 there's a fudo ow there's a fudo ow there's a fudo as opposed to a phasic receptor which is going to say, you know, sometimes when you're hanging from a single ankle and you go, oh, 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 there's a single ankle. Oh, I don't feel anything anymore. Okay. <laughs> done. I'm done. I'm done. It's done. Because the phasic receptor fired once and then nothing. And we, we deal more with phasic receptors um, with, those, with those single tails. Those are the ones that go, wow, this was a really intense sensory input. Wow, this was a really intense sensory input. One at a time. So how do you differentiate between that and what we always talk about with nerve damage? When we say if you suddenly can't feel your limb, then you're you're saying you don't. That's not that you don't feel your limb, but you don't feel that pain. Right. As opposed to we don't feel anything at all. Right. Okay. Well, phasic receptors, as as long as there's a new sensory input, the receptors are going to fire. So if you can't feel your limb, even though there's a new sensory input, then something is not um, something is not working as it normally does within your body. You know what I find is a pity about this whole thing is that you talked about they're doing this for the the bottom education network, and I'm sitting here thinking about all the tops who will spend hundreds of dollars on a single tail, and maybe hundreds of dollars on classes on how to use a single tail, and hours and hours of practice on using the single tail, but won't want to go to a class on this kind of stuff to learn how the single tail is actually affecting the bottom, and then take the time with the bottom to figure out how the because this is all. We're talking, we're like doing, no pun intended, Grey's Anatomy here. We're talking in general strokes of what things are like, and everybody is different and going to have different responses. Yeah. How, how do, um, for example, somebody on SSRI inhibitors, uh, how does that change this whole spectrum of things? Oh, my gosh. Um, or is that a bigger topic than we can cover? <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big topic, and it's a topic that is still really actively... We're, we're doing active research on the effect of SSRIs on the brain. Um, we didn't talk about serotonin. Yeah, I, I would love to talk about serotonin because I, even with my research, don't really understand what serotonin... I know how to, I, I know how to rebalance my serotonin. But I don't know what they're actually doing. I just know that, you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling down, I'll say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go out. I'm going to eat a good meal. I'm going to do some exercise. I'm going to do something non-kinky. And when I'm done, I feel better. Right. And, and I've been told that I probably helped rebalance my serotonin. But I have no idea what that actually means. So please, explain serotonin to me okay. in, in simple words. Okay, so serotonin is your contented molecule. So we, we talked about your, your pain-killing molecules. We talked about your trust, happiness molecules. We, no, serotonin is just your contented molecules. And what SSRIs are is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So remember how when we talked about cocaine, um, it's a dopamine reuptake inhibitor? Mm -hmm. Well, this is kind of the same thing, actually, um, except for we've done it in pharmacologic ways that have been shown to help patients with depression and actually a number of other mental illnesses be more able to um, to, to manage their illness. Um, so um, that, that, is, that is the pathway that does contentedness, but because no medication is perfect and all medications have side effects, um, it doesn't just affect the serotonin, serotonin um, 
pathway and so there are some there are some side effects to SSRIs that are specific to kink that we don't have you know double blinded studies for right now what a shock yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah I know that when Naya started her um, her medication her pain tolerance for a while it was way down like you know where I used to be beating the heck out of her um, I would, you know, do one tiny thing and suddenly that would be more than she could take. Or more effect, more specifically, we found it in rope, where suspensions that used to be able to be fine were agonizingly painful. Um, and it was interesting to recalibrate our kink. We were able to do it. We found other ways to express it. But it was, a, it was a definitely a case where the things that used to work didn't work anymore. And there can be a crisis of confidence, especially I mean, on my end. It was a, am I doing it wrong? Am I no longer you know, able, to, able to do that? Um, and I can't speak for her. Wait, yes, I can. She's mine. Um, uh, Naya, how did it feel to you when you went on your medication and you found that you, your pain tolerance had changed? Come closer and say to the microphone. Um, it was very upsetting because I had it sort of had my identity based in being able to do the demo and rope suspension, and I was a rope bottom. And it was very, very difficult for me because suddenly the identity that I had was being challenged. I felt so much better, but there was this weird, like, I'm a failure thing happening. Um, and so I had to kind of deal with that and it may be uh atypical or may not be but we found also after how many years now two years of being on three and a half three and a half years of being on them um now her pain tolerance seems to be coming back and things that we used to be able to so now i have to learn it all over again <laughs> <sighs> i am also though starting to think that i might have to up my dosage because i think my body is leveling out um it's getting too used to the dosage i'm on so the idea is to be flexible, I guess, and be able to... The only thing that I can compare this specific phenomenon with BDSM to is our studies of the use of SSRIs in patients with um, eating disorders. Oh. Okay. Um, because um, that, that is at times specifically for, for patients with um, bulimia, which is, which is a restrictive eating disorder that doesn't cause a decrease um, in body mass index. That's how we define bulimia in the, the DSM-5. Um, and so there have been some studies that show that SSRIs are really, really useful for patients like that. Um, and one of the one of the current ideas about why that might be is um, patients um, with with depression, patients with with decreased serotonin bouncing around in their central nervous system, experience um, apathy and anhedonia. Anhedonia. Um, Things just don't see, aren't fun anymore. Yeah, things just aren't fun anymore. They're staring out into the distance, and things that used to cause them pleasure no longer cause them pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and apathy, things that used to cause them sensory input, no longer cause them sensory input. And when you have more serotonin bouncing around in your central nervous system, all of a sudden things that caused you pleasure before are causing you pleasure again. Things that caused you sensory input before are causing you sensory input again people who are on SSRIs often describe a quickening of their mental pace. Um, and people who are depressed often describe that they feel slow, sluggish, or like they have, um, like they have a haze in front of their mm -hmm. eyes and SSRIs can help with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we use it for patients with eating disorders at times, um, because they're getting, they're getting sensory input from eating. They're getting pleasure from eating. Um, and they don't think that SSRIs themselves cause a weight gain, but but patients can, they finally have, like, food tastes good, finally. And then you would like to eat, um, which is really good, which is really good for those patients. So I'm making huge, non-scientifically based inferences right now, but I would imagine that if, if someone in, involved in kink or someone who was just a sexual being um, was having trouble experiencing sexual pleasure or, or sensory input or even painful stimuli because of a lack of serotonin bouncing around in their brain, once they got it back, the stimuli are going to go through because their brain is working at a faster pace. Um, they're able to perceive more sensory input and that may normalize again. And then either they're mentally feeling good and, and they're normalized or, you know, dosages may change and it's you know it's very very individual um neurochemistry is 
I've heard it called the final frontiers of medicine. Hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things. And a lot of the research that I did, a lot of it, the deeper you went, you finally get to a point where they'd be like, mm-hmm. eh, I don't know, yeah, maybe something, you know, <laughs> something happens here. We're not sure what. Yeah. We, um, we have a, a medication right now called Wellbutrin. It's called Bupropion, um, which is kind of like an SSRI, kind of like an SNRI. And a lot of the answer to why it works as well as it does is, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, we have a, a selective uh, studio audience here. Are there any questions that anyone has that uh, or comments about things? Yes. Do you mind being on the podcast? Oh, okay, great. Um, one thing that this kind of reminds me of is a great TED Talk. There are actually two of them by Helen Fisher, which talks yes. about the brain in love. And um, she's an anthropologist, so she also kind of talks about love in the world, which is cool. But similarly, talks about what parts of the brain are stimulated when you're in love and talks she doesn't use the term nre that's the term that we use often and she talks about new love versus mm-hmm. love that's been in your life for 40 years and it's kind of surprising the studies found that you still get pretty excited when that person walks into the room even if you've been with them for a really long time yep. it's neat so i encourage yeah. people to listen um to this as well. yeah helen fisher although she also has some unfortunate views on polly that are not so happy. I have not heard um, of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's unfortunate. I, I, was, I was a huge fan of hers until I read those. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. Dude. Um, yeah, there's another, uh, Professor Arthur Aaron is actually how I start my thing, who did the, the class, uh, or an experiment where he had complete strangers meet, each uh, paired up, and then they had to reveal to each other intimate details about their lives for half an hour. And then stare deeply into their eyes for four minutes. And then he measured the relative affection of these people, along with, you know, a control group of people that hadn't done such as. And the levels of affection were very, very deep after three, four minutes. And two of them got married. Um, and um, so so that's, uh, that's part of the, the whole thing of, you know, it, it is a lot of it is just the chemistry and things. Like that. Naya and I had a weird chemical reaction when we first met. Um, and I was at the time sitting there with my girlfriend and she was Evan's bottom for the day and was in the house of her two, uh, partners. Mm -hmm. So there was no way that I was going to actually flirt with this person or I had no, you know, but there was a connection there. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting that we think we have control of these things. Um, like the classic poly line of, look, you can play with them. But don't fall in love. <laughs> As if there's a, a way to control that a lot of times. It's interesting. I think you can control the reactions, you can control the behaviors, but you can't control the feelings. So, that's my theory. They can't hear you nod. <laughs> I'm, I'm emphatically <laughs> nodding. <Okay. laughs> cool. Well, if there's no other questions from the audience, then I'm going to ask you anything you want to add to this or... Um, I mean, there, we can talk about this forever, but unfortunately, the podcast needs to be about an hour or so. Yeah. Just, just that, you know, a lot of this research is ongoing, mm-hmm. um, and my area of expertise isn't, isn't neurology. It's actually the blood vessels. I'm, I'm a body plumbing person. Um, so, <laughs> you know, please take this with the grain of salt that I am a student, and this isn't my area of expertise. It's just an area of fun research that I do on the side. Well, and that's the fun part about this is that since our government doesn't decide to fund sex research, technically you're about as close to an authority on the subject as we can get, you know. So, um, but yeah, and that's not to impugn you. It's just to say thank you for your work because it's nice that somebody is actually looking at this in this way. Um, so I have lightning questions for you for everybody on the podcast, and uh, so these are these are simple questions, just you know whatever comes to mind. What is your beverage of choice? Alcoholic or non-alcoholic? What's your beverage? I, I say, hey, you want something to drink? What would you want? Um, Either one. Uh, apple cider. Alcoholic or non-alcoholic? Non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> Warm or cold? Warm, please. All right. Cinnamon or none? Cinnamon. Absolutely. Okay. So part of the reason I do these things is so that, you know, somebody might hear it and know that you're coming to an event and surprise you with exactly what you want. <laughs> That's that's kind of I'm trying to help people out with the anticipatory service thing here. Um, how about your favorite food? Um, avocado sushi. Oh, okay. All right. As as made by Rufio. I was just going to ask where you like to have it, but now it's a, a personal sushi chef there. Nice. Um, okay. What uh, what is a, a good book you'd recommend? Oh gosh, so 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 many. Um, uh. 
I have to go from things I'm currently reading, I guess. Um, Gosh, you have to you have to say a cool book so you don't sound like a nerd that only reads young adult fiction. You like, can totally do that. Do anything you want to do. <laughs> um, I've only got like three listeners, so don't worry about it. <laughs> oh God, I'm getting really nervous by these questions. Um, Vlad, what am I reading right now? Um, a book. A book. A book. Um, okay, I can make it. I can change this question to make it a little easier, maybe. Okay. okay, you're gonna be stuck on a desert island for six months. You can only bring one book. What book do you bring? Um, probably Crime and Punishment. Oh. Because it's long enough to keep me busy for three months. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. That's fair. All right. Um, and uh, Naya and I want to have a movie night. Okay. And we we are asking, hey, what what's a movie you'd recommend? Beast of the Southern Wild. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I actually haven't gotten to see that one yet. That's that's right. That's it's so good. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, let's get back into the kink stuff. Um, I have a magic wand, and I can wave my magic wand, and anybody, fictional, real, alive, de- I mean, they'll be alive if they're already dead, um, uh, past, future, anything, any character at all, any person at all, will appear in perfect health and want to play with you. Who would you like to have appear? I feel like there's a right answer that is. It's to whatever say, answer you say. Okay, I'm just going to give the honest answer. Maynard James Keenan, the lead singer of Tool, if he could like tie me up and ride me like he did that one individual at a concert in the 1990s, that'd be totally cool. <laughs> okay, we 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 have agreement in the audience too. So. All right, um, what's something in your toy bag that would surprise people? I have a lot of needles in my toy really? bag, I'm and I have a lot of suture in my toy bag. So wait a minute. So you're but you're in a medical field, and you still enjoy doing like needle play and suture play, or is this just because you're in case? Yeah, I am. I I at one time had a lovely partner who was a really badass masochistic bottom um, who loved sharps and let me put all sorts of sutures in her. Wow. So sitting around in my toy cool. bag. Cool. That does surprise me. Okay. Um, and the final question. What is your favorite dirty word? Um, oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I could ask Rufio. <laughs> what, what, what? Okay. <laughs> What's my favorite dirty word? I don't even know. Now I want to know your answer. Oh gosh, um, moo. Moo. <laughs> Is that it? Is that what you think? What's one of your favorite dirty words? <laughs> 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 and, and do you mind if I describe what you're doing right now? Because it's very amusing. Because Aranis is, is trying to hide from everyone by pulling her shirt up over her head and then hugging her knees without realizing that this also basically holds up her ass for everybody to see. <laughs> which is which is not exactly the most non-vulnerable position I've seen somebody in. Oh my gosh, I'm overheating. So, <laughs> but okay, moo. That's, that's an interesting... Do you want to put that into a context that makes it dirty? Because uh, otherwise, we're all just going to do it in our heads. <laughs> it's probably exactly what you're thinking. Um, got a little bit of a cow thing. Um, I, I like I like really cute female and male. Actually, I, I like very really cute all gender hue cows. Um, and hue cows. Yeah. Human cows. Human cows. Okay. I think they're pretty cool. Cool. <laughs> That's my like really shameful kink that I just <laughs> announced to everyone over your podcast. This is awesome. Hey, nice. Said all three listeners have heard it, and now they know. So I also I also like people who take care of um, balloons. I think that balloons are are a kind of hot, dirty thing for me too. That might okay. be a surprising dirty word that I'm into. Balloon. Balloons. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Wow, that's, that's like one of the more intimate answers to that question I've ever had. Awesome. Um, so if people have questions for you about this subject or about Hugh Cows or anything like that, um, would you like them to just talk to the podcast or do you have a way they can contact you? Uh, yeah, find me on FetLife. Um, O-R-A-N-I-S? Yep, O-R-A-N-N-I-S. Okay, excellent. Um, and where, it, or you said this is a class you're teaching. Where are you teaching, uh, 
next or, or where you maybe people see you perform or um i actually have a pretty clear schedule for for a while so hit me up with opportunities to teach or perform that would be great <laughs> yes and we heartily recommend her as part of the rope craft staff we definitely recommend uh around for lots of things and as a performer too oh my god um so thank you very much for the podcast. Thank you, everyone, for doing this. I want to also thank our pa- our, our sponsors. Our sponsors, <laughs> uh, Twisted Monk, who makes fantastic hand-dyed uh, hemp rope and has also exotic ropes like uh, silk and bamboo and a lot of other things. I have my monk sack here. If anybody wants to take a look at the monk sack, it is, it is awesome because, as he said, it is awesome because it's based on one of the greatest scientific discoveries of the human age, the burrito. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is what makes it work. Um, and Lee Allure, leeallure.com, who has done a lot of stuff, uh, has great uh, free files you can download on her website, as well as um, some that you can purchase, which are even hotter and sexier. So Naya and I are going to be um, finishing up here at the Philly Gru and then heading home. Uh, the next Gru after this is San Diego uh, in August. You can always find out more about that stuff at grew.space. And um, I'll also be teaching a uh, Consent Rocks training program, uh, two of them coming up this summer. One is in Pittsburgh, and uh, one is in Oakland, California at the Vox Body Studio. Um, you can find out more about those at consent.rocks and further trainings as well. So uh, that's where we'll be, and you can always find me at greatanswer@gmail.com. And uh, very easy to stalk. Great answer on Twitter. Great answer everywhere else. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the podcast. And uh, we will talk to you later. Because when it comes to King Section culture, it's not as easy as black and white. So sometimes you have to dance in the gray.